Jetzt ist sie hier. Herzlich willkommen, Svenja Busson, die Autorin von Exploring the Future of Education und Gründerin von LearnSpace. Herzlich willkommen. Herzlichen Dank. Guten Morgen. Hello, everyone. My speak is going to be in English uh, because, you know, this is also an English speaking event and uh, yeah, I wanted it to be in English. So let's go. I'm very, very happy to, uh, to be here. So my background, I started as an explorer uh, when I went, uh, when I was still in business school. I wanted to explore the world, to look at other ways of teaching and learning. So basically what I did is a world tour to explore education, technology and education innovations across the globe. Fascinating project. I saw many, many things um, and I explored 19 different countries. Um, so that was amazing. Uh, and then I came back and I wanted to help startups uh, in EdTech. So I started a startup accelerator, um, which turned into a consulting firm for schools, universities. We helped them digitize. Um, and basically, I started various industry associations to support startups, like in France, EdTech France, and in Europe, the European EdTech Alliance, uh, an alliance of 23 different organizations from 15 countries in Europe coming together and discussing how we could build a European EdTech way, basically. So a very ambitious uh, um, initiative that I'm very, very happy to be part of. So yeah, today I wanted to tell you a bit more about my findings across the globe. I think some of these findings can be quite exciting uh, for, for some of you. Um, so please feel free also to ask me any questions you might have on the chat. I would be super happy to answer them. Uh, so if you want infos on a specific country or anything, just feel free to, uh, to shoot your questions. So these are the countries that I've been to. Um, and very excitingly, you know, I, I, I started um, by choosing one country per continent. And then I traveled to many different parts of the world, so I, I added some countries to the list. But there's one country here that was quite striking to me. Uh, I didn't really expect what I, was fi what, what I found there, actually. Um, and um, so, yeah, I mean, it's a, a country in Southeast Asia. You know, Southeast Asia has a completely different education system. Um, it's very geared towards competition and, you know, having um, the best spot in the best universities, so kids have a lot of pressure. And actually, South Korea is such a country. So, very fun fact, like in South Korea, the pressure is so high, basically, on students, on their achievement, on their grades, that, you know, students uh, have to go to after schools, you know, when they finish school at five, they go to after schools to continue studying until very late hours of the night, actually. Um, so, that was quite striking to me. And also, during their, you know, uh, abitur, their baccalaureate, Day, they they basically you know um, have such a pressure. The whole country is like on hold. The flights are cancelled, so you cannot you won't see any flights in any any um, you know planes in the air because it could deconcentrate some of the students taking their their baccalaureate exam. So really huge pressure in this country, and so innovation ed tech is very hardly getting into the education system because of that pressure because they don't want to change anything. They have great results. Um, and yeah, so very hard to innovate in this country. But in other countries, like we're, we're going to see today, it's uh amazing what's happening there, especially in Europe, in the Nordics, but also in Southern Europe, so you have very interesting things. So let's dive in. And if you have any questions again on any particular country, please feel free to put them on the chat. So for me, the future of work starts with the future of education and the future of higher education, of course. And we have a problem. We have a problem because in the US, 96% of chief academic officers believe their institutions are effectively preparing their students for the world of work. And on the other side of the spectrum, we have 11% only of employers believing that and agreeing that universities actually teach, graduate the skills needed to succeed in their workspace, in their workplace. So this is a huge issue. What do we do about it? We have a huge skills gap. Universities are not equipped anymore uh, to basically teach the skills and adapt their curricula to the world of, you know, the changing world of today. So what do we do about it? At the same time, 80% of the jobs students will fill in the future do not exist today. And 91% of employers said 
a demonstrated capacity to think critically, communicate clearly, solve complex problems, is more important than a job candidate's undergraduate degree. So again, what do we do about this? Uh, do we really teach you know, important skills at university, or are they still pretty much academic? So the relevant skills for the industry and, and actually the, the, work, the workplace and, um, are not taught in university and in schools, in higher ed in general. What are the top 10 skills in 2025? Actually, these skills, uh, this is a, f a report uh, done by the World Economic Forum uh, last year, and they interviewed tons of HR and you know, tens of HR directors across the globe, and what they found out is that skills that really make a difference are these ones, and actually, you know, I don't know for you, but I haven't really learned these skills at university. So active, analyti analytical thinking, active learning, learning strategies, learning how to learn basically is a top skill because today you have to learn constantly, evolve constantly, relearn, unlearn what you've learned because skills are moving so fast. So complex problem solving, critical thinking, creativity, leadership, obviously technology use, technology design, resilience, stress tolerance, flexibility, all these skills are soft skills uh, apart from the technology use and design. And so when you look at these, I, you, know, we, you, you see that we, we have some kind of problem <laughs> because we don't teach these skills accordingly. So what can we do? Um, I think there is a huge rise in what we see you know, in the edtech ecosystem, especially in Europe and the US, is the rise of boot camps. Boot camps come as you know, an alternative often to higher education institutions. Um, and basically, they solve a real problem. Because when you look at the time needed to start building new skills online in jobs of tomorrow, you look at skills like people and culture, content writing, sales, marketing skills, one to two months. You look at product development, data, AI skills, two to three months. Cloud computing, engineering skills, four to five months. So there are today new actors, new stakeholders coming into the scene, building programs that are super agile, super efficient to train you know, people, um, and, and they last for you know, two months, three months, maybe six months program, but they can adapt their curriculum, they can adapt their whole concept in a very short time, and that makes the whole difference. So these boot camps, I just mentioned a few here, are really changing the landscape for me. Um, and and the, the boot camp market is booming for a reason. So basically, when you have to upskill yourself and learn a new skill, will you go to university or to business school or to engineering school, or will you go to a boot camp, you know, spend two or three months on the program, very, very intense, and learn skills that are applicable like tomorrow in your job. So basically, I really believe that these um, boot camp models are, are the future. I'm not saying they will replace universities, they will replace higher education institutions. I don't think so, um, because we still need academia, we still need research, of course, but they are much more adapted to the changing world of work, where skills evolve so fastly that you have to adapt and you have to constantly train yourself. So how can we change our organizations? Um, how can we change our higher education institutions, uh, the present one, the older ones? Um, well, you know, I think we can innovate in, in pedagogy and didactics, and that can be a great solution to also teach 21st century skills. Um, so better, more relevant, K-12 institutions, higher ed, it all starts in K-12, actually. So I want to share a K-12 example with you because it's an example that really struck me, um, an example from New Zealand. And actually, I was so amazed by the school and these kids that I think this pedagogy and, and, and the, the, the way they use technology is also applicable to older years, actually. So um, the Manaya Canali School Cluster in Auckland is located in a very 
deprived area of Auckland, the capital city of New Zealand. These kids are Maori kids, so M Maori is their first language. They don't speak a good English. The whole curriculum is in English in New Zealand. And so they struggle. And so the school, with the teachers together, created a new model for pedagogy called the Learn, Create, Share model. And this model allows these kids to learn differently in a different setup. So basically, they have to of course, like learn basic skills, learning how to read, how to write, how to count, that's for sure. But how they learn is completely different. Um, so they will learn by creating artifacts, creating artworks out of their learning, for example. So at the end, at the end of each um, chapter, we ask them to come together as a team and do like a team work uh, of basically making a tangible artwork Add, um, you know, out of their learnings. Um, and so I was there during a history class where they learned about Nelson Mandela, the apartheid, and then in a group of fours, they started creating artwork. So the group that I was following created a song, a rap song on, um, on Nelson Mandela, and, and then they wanted to film a clip, so they took their iPads and they used it in a very creative way. They filmed the clip, and then on their own, they edited the clip on the iPad, and it was, it was quite a successful um, endeavor and they had like three hours to do that and at the end they were graded on that group work and not you know on a test that you would take um, and you would learn by hard things um, and forget them you know in a week I'm sure these kids won't forget their uh, history lesson for, for a very very long time so you know active learning methodologies active learning pedagogies like project-based learning like we see here are methodologies that you can use in your institution to really also um, make sure that skills like collaboration, creativity, critical thinking are, are taught through pedagogy, through uh, these methods. So really interesting uh, example. And the share uh, part, the last part is really to ask them you know, uh, to share the learning. And this pedagogy is based on John Hattie's work in New Zealand. And John Hattie is a researcher in education science. And he says, you have to make learning visible. You have to make learning as tangible as possible. So these kids, each Friday, have their blog post. They have to write a personal blog post about something they learned in school, something they, they want to keep for themselves and share with the world. So um, they're asked to write a blog about the learnings of the week. Uh, and that helps them a lot consolidate their learning. So really interesting uh, pedagogy that is now put in place in many schools across New Zealand because it has proven so effective on these kids. And again, technology is almost inv invisible in this example. And I don't want to put the focus on technology because technology Technology should support learning, and it shouldn't be in the spotlight. It should always be, you know, um, a side um, support that is almost invisible, but that is supporting teachers and students alike. School as a service, super interesting, um, you know, innovation from Finland. A collaboration between Aalto University in Espoo uh, near Helsinki and a new school that was created uh, in the university premises. So it was a high school um, for for kids, you know, um, that 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 lived in the area, and they basically said, why should we build another building uh, and spend millions of, of of euros in a new building when you can you when we can use the premises? of the university and the premises of the city. So basically what they did is that they imagined like a service platform with a heart in the middle. It's the co-working space where students come and meet and have lunch together. It's a social sharing space. And then classes take place in the premises in a one to two kilometer radius. Um, and basically they have their history class in the, in, the, in the history department of the university. Then they have their French class at the local library. So the library of the city of Espoo uh, is also you know, providing uh, some space for them once a week so that they can learn French in this environment. And so they walk around the whole day from one stop to another, from one class to another. So they activate their bodies, very important and they change environments every two hours. And so basically, why could we think of cities, of university campuses as you know, learning playgrounds, basically, for students. So this, um, this you know, 
experimentation has proven very really successful. Now they opened in Shanghai, another school as a service, also in a district in Shanghai where you know the sports facilities of the cities are, are, are used by the school. Um, museums can be used as learning places. So yeah, I like this idea of seeing a city and using also a big university campus as a learning uh, space and a learning playground. So really interesting example uh, from Finland. Another example on how we could already bridge the skills gap, you know, in, in secondary school is to say, you know, why don't we teach kids how to use technology effectively, not just, you know, use them as um, something you know, recreational, but something useful. So basically this program is a public-private partnership, very rare in Europe that these public-private partnerships work, uh, but this public-private partnership has proven super successful in Catalonia um, with partnering with the university, I mean the local ministry, sorry, of education and a private foundation. And basically what it does, it teaches kids in secondary school to use technology for the better. So basically they, they, they teach, they they, they learn how to basically build apps uh, for social purposes. So they get out there and they see in their community what problems they see, and then they come back in school and they build an app for one year uh, that can have um, a, a big impact on their communities. So basically teaching them to become change makers and see technology as something that they can really use for making the world a better place. And I think that's really important to also teach them about digital literacy, to teach them that you know there are algorithms uh, that basically decide on whatever they they, they, they they experience online and and so very important to also bridge that gap in terms of digital skills at the very early age and it, we have to start you know as early as possible so when these kids are finished during one year they have learned how to build an app on the MIT app inventor tool and you know they've solved a real problem in their communities so really interesting example and um, they're now it's trying to um, to scale that example to to other high schools in um, in other parts of, uh, of of Spain. So you know. K-12 institutions at the forefront of pedagogical, technological innovations. You have lots of them. I put some examples here, but obviously they're not, there's so many others, but I had the chance to visit these schools during my world tours. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so if you have the chance to, to, to look at them, uh, they are really amazing for me at the forefront. Now higher ed, because you know we're also here for, for higher ed, obviously, but for me it's a continuum. We cannot think of reforming higher ed without thinking of reforming K-12. So higher ed, one of the main examples for me is Minerva. I think you all, you all might know Minerva schools. Um, Minerva schools is a really interesting example because it started you know, with a former Harvard dean in the US. He was a bit tired you know, to sit uh, and to stand on, 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 his, uh, on his beautiful um, stage uh, every day and he wanted something much more innovative and so because at Harvard it wasn't possible to really innovate uh, he decided to create his own university called Minerva Schools um, and basically he wanted to put the student experience at the very center of it he wanted the students to have the best experience possible and after four years of undergraduates you know just dreaming of, 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 of you know, continuing to study. So basically what he did is he built a university that is 100% online. Uh, and what, what they do is they travel the world and they do a big world tour during their studies. <laughs> so that's one thing. And so obviously they cannot ask professors to follow the students on their world tour. So professors stay home and they have this, this online classroom that allows them to follow their classes online. A very effective tool, you know, with a lot of, you know, big data in it so that the professor can see who speaks, how much time, who didn't uh, talk yet, so that it can stay very interactive. So these classes are super interactive, 20 students max, and basically, yeah, um, very short, very interactive. And then the rest of the, the, the week, they, they have free time to spend, you know, uh, time on their internships, on, on projects, of their own and yeah and they basically tour the world so it's 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 basically a world tour they start in uh, San Francisco for the first six months uh, during the first six months they will only learn in about soft skills so the whole curriculum is about soft skills in the first six months um, 
and that's quite unique because, you know, as I said, soft skills are not taught in schools usually. And uh, in this school, particular school, they have a huge focus on soft skills. So they, they teach them to think critically. They teach them to think outside of the box, to think creatively, um, to collaborate efficiently. So really, really amazing soft skills um, Curriculum, and then you know they travel the globe, and they 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 they, they choose after their, the first year they choose their spe specialty. So they have like in all universities, uh, um, they can choose their specialty, and and after four years they graduate. Um, and you know they they spend so much time traveling. They they spend six months on each continent. So San Francisco six months, then Berlin six months, Buenos Aires, Seoul, Hyderabad in India. London, Taipei. So basically, for them, it's it's amazing because they come back after four years. They've they, they've lived across the globe on every continent. They know many languages for sure, and they have work experience in all these uh, places. So it makes a huge difference. And you know, they they they, they haven't. Um, once, I mean, once they're graduated, they, they, they just uh, find a very easy um, job. So basically, they have um, a very high employment rate. Um, so it's, it's really an interesting model. And obviously, for the US, it's, it's kind of revolutionary because the costs um, of you know, very high costs in the US for higher ed is linked to campuses, is linked to uh, you know, having to sustain these large buildings. And here, because everything's online, you don't have the, the problem of the cost, basically. So very interesting model that costs, you know, five times less than the usual universities in the U.S. And um, and now it's harder to get into Minerva than it is to get into Harvard, actually. So the, the everyone now wants to get to Minerva, and I understand, you know, the high schoolers of, of today wanting to have this kind of experience rather than to sit on a campus for five years and and being anonymous, basically. So really, really interesting model. Uh, Hyper Island in Sweden, very interesting model in a former prison on an island. They basically rebuilt the whole the whole prison in the inside and built a university out of it. Um, and this university is like super experiential. So everything is done through projects, real life projects with real clients, super um, uh, effective also because teachers, there's no like lecture rooms, lecture halls, it's only projects. Um, and for example, you know, they've been asked by Electrolux. Um, it's one of the examples, but they have lots of uh, different uh, partners, university partners and Electrolux, you know, uh, ask the students to develop a millennial vision of the Electrolux home product. And so they had one month to, to build the, the vision, the strategy uh, for millennials. And at the end, they had a board meeting, you know, with uh, electro the Electrolux board and having to present in front of them. I mean, it's a real need, a real company, a real case. It's very exciting to work on these type of things. So the engagement there is super high, very, very, very high. And, um, and basically what they do is they really prepare them for the world of work. So what they do is when they have a one month project, for example, they would cut the project at the third week and say, you know, guys, sorry, but the board wants, uh, wants your results and your strategy tomorrow. So you only have one day left. You thought you had one week left. You only have one day left. So they also work on the adaptability of students um, and because that, that, that's, that is, that's a scenario that can also happen in real life. And so basically they work on their adaptability skills and ask them, you know, from one day to another to, uh, to adapt the, the whole. Their, their, their whole strategy. So very, very funny, but also, you know, very effective. So Hyper Island, I mean, if you have the chance to ever visit that university, it's, uh, it's just uh, very amazing, very inspiring. Other higher education institutions, you know, you have the London Interdisciplinary School. Uh, I don't know if you heard of it, but it's an amazing problem-based learning only university where everything is learned through problems. So every week you come into the university and you have a problem and you have to solve it in an interdisciplinary matter. Um, you know, it could mix economics, gender studies and something else. And, and you have one week to solve that problem basically in a team. So, you know, I'm really interested in these new types of universities really trying to build up the skill sets of, of tomorrow through these very innovative ways of teaching. Uh, Code University here in Berlin with, you know, project-based learning on real-life projects, really interesting. Um, you have the European Leadership University, um, skills and community-based learning uh, in the Netherlands. Um, 
and yeah, and so many others that I really strongly recommend you to look at. For me, these are, you know, top top innovative institutions. So if you have a chance uh, um, to look at it, just uh, do. <laughs> and uh, and yeah, and if you want to go further with these resources, so I've wrote a book on the on the future of education in Europe specifically. So um, you know, talking about what's happening not only in the Nordics. Everyone talks about the Nordics; they're doing amazing things, but also in Southern Europe, in Western and Eastern Europe. Um, if you are specifically interested in business education, if you are a business school or teaching you know, a business or economics, this could be of interest. Uh, we wrote a whole report on how to teach uh, business in a very innovative way. Um, and, yeah, and EdTech specifically, I wrote some reports and some articles that you can find on edtechtours.com. And yeah, I'm really happy and looking forward to your, to your questions. Um, and you know, please feel, feel free to to share them in the chat. And if you want to reach out, please feel free. I would be happy uh, uh, to read you. And uh, thank you so much for listening in and uh, for your time. Thanks. Thanks a lot, uh, yes, for, uh, to you, Svenja, for really kicking off our morning session here for EdTech in a rapid-paced input session. And um, we have the first questions already. So if you give me two seconds to see of which course. question makes sense to start with. Yeah. Um, uh, da -da -da -da. Um, well, I'll just go through it uh, without um, a necessary order, but um, let's see, um, Andre wrote, um, important question, who pays for it? Who and pays? Um, then there's a sub-comment um, by Teresa uh, referencing Mark saying, probably you need a private university to make these things possible. What's your take on that? Yeah, very, very important question, and thank you for asking it. Um, basically, of course, these uh, are mostly mostly private universities, uh, but with an innovative business model. So they have a business model where it's partly also paid by their future employers. Uh, for example, Minerva schools ha have a big foundation behind them, um, and they they raise money for for the basically for the fees to be as low as possible for the students, and they have 80% of students who are, um, you know, um, on, I mean, who gets like financing aid. Um, so it's huge, it's quite huge, and they want to make the price tag as low as possible. Uh, but again, I think, you know, these universities, because they're private and because they're just starting, are more agile in a way than larger public universities, but it doesn't mean that you cannot be innovative in the public university. And I've seen examples where that's the case. And yeah, you just, you know, need a bit of, uh, yeah, it, it, it's, it's challenging in a way, but, you know, training your, your professors of, you know, thinking differently, teaching differently, um, and, um, and trying new things, like experimenting, testing and learning and uh, being that in that mindset. So, so yeah. So it's more challenging, but it is still possible. Um, if I go through the chat early on in your talk, Jürgen posted a screenshot uh, saying you don't have to travel that far to find great examples. I think he has a project himself here in Germany, <laughs> and he just showcased um, his um, workshop room. So thanks, Jürgen. Um, Teresa asked, I'm not sure what she referenced to, but I think it was one of your very early on examples. How would you adapt this concept to classes like law? Law. Yeah. I, I mean, I guess when it's about social skills or more some even like, yeah. you know, more pragmatic courses. Yeah. But yeah. how do you really dive into something deep? <laughs> yeah. <law? laughs> Very interesting points. Actually, you know, uh, I, I, I build programs for, for, for business schools um, in terms of, you know, teaching differently. So I, I, I build programs for, for professors to learn how to teach differently. And they, we have a lot of law, business law professors also uh, who ask us exactly the same question because they have a very deep topic. And I think it's always possible to teach differently. Like you have, you, you, you have to try, you have to uh, see how you can flip your classroom, for example, how you, make, you can make sure that your students might do the class today and you sit in the audience and listen to them and then give them feedback. Flipped classroom can be a, a way, or you can try to make them work on a specific project, on a case study. The case study method, for example, is you know, a, a, a method that you can use and is uh, quite old, but quite innovative. So I think, you know, there are many ways uh, that you can find to, um, to, you know, to teach differently, even if you teach law, for example. I'm, I'm, yeah, and now we have law professors that, that, are, that are adapting these new pedagogies to their, uh, to their stuff, and uh, it works, it works. 
And Catherine had a question referencing the uh, example where you spoke about soft skills, and she was asking how exactly do they teach soft skills during the first six months? Very interesting question. So basically what they do is um, that they, for example, everything takes place online again. Uh, so basically for the first six months, they, what they do is they're organized, for example, large debates. Uh, they split the class in two and they said, you are pro and you are against topic Z. And, uh, and then they have to prepare the debate. Um, they have to think outside of the box, even if they don't you know, agree with the, the, the thing they have to um, uh, I mean, with, with the opinion that they have to defend, they have to prepare and they have to find the arguments, and they have to think outside of the box. That's one example. Second example is they give them great also tools, like creativity tools. Um, they teach them about design thinking, they teach them about all of these things, collaboration, all these skills about, you know, bringing, being together, working together. They also have, you know, specific classes on, on how to uh, listen to each other, collaborate with each other. So I think you know, they cover the whole spectrum of skills, of 21st century skills, but they, they, they um, basically split them in under um, categories of skills, and they have like now like 150 skills, I think, that they teach. Uh, so they take the, the big ones, and then they split them in micro skills, and that's, that's how they've, that they've worked, yeah. I hope that answers some of your questions in more detail, but um, as Svenja said, she's very happy um, to be of assistance if you reach out to her. Um, what I saw, which is really great, is that you're starting the discussion amongst yourself in the chat already. I saw that uh, Manuel Dolderer of Code University is present. He said that's exactly what inspired us, some of these examples, um, to launch Code University. What I love is that Philip then um, referenced that. He said, I really like all of these approaches, but um, universities usually have more tasks than just preparing students for their job. Code University 42, etc., are without a doubt perfect to find a job, but not necessarily for research and a scientific track. Yeah, very important part. I mean, I, I, that's what I told you earlier. I obviously we will still need universities, like traditional universities, uh, because we need research, of course. Um, but you know, for, for teaching practical skills, um, having new types of universities like Code Emerge or having boot camps like Le Wagon or, or others can really help you know, you know, train uh, people on a very you know, skill and competency-based level. And that, that's, that we really need because the, you know, the rate and the, 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 we, we are, we're getting you know, in a very fast-paced world where upskilling, reskilling is absolutely necessary. Uh, and every job are going through it. So, uh, so lots of, uh, of skills are disappearing, new ones are appearing. So we all have to constantly learn, relearn, unlearn. And for that, we really need these types of universities, of boot camps, of, of schools that are much more practical and, and skill-based. skill, skill based. Yeah. I think we take time for two more questions. Because I saw Philip followed up his comment with another interesting thought. And he said, um, all these approaches seem to focus on the top 5% of students. And he doubts that, um, yeah, students who are not really uh, part of the top 5% um, would have problems keeping up with such a high-paced environment. Mm, what are your thoughts question. on that? Yeah, very interesting question. I don't think it, it, it only represents the top five, very honestly. Minerva, maybe, yes, <laughs> because Minerva is an example. It's, it's, you know, it's for the top 0 0.1, basically. <laughs> so I agree. But with the other examples, you know, it's quite... Um, you can access it quite easily. Uh, 42 is accessible by anyone who just has the will to, to, to learn. Uh, 42 is a coding school, basically, and it's completely free. You just go there, you, you do one month of intensive training. At the end, you have a short exam. If you pass it, you, can, you, you get in. If you don't pass it, you, you don't. Uh, but it's very open. People from various backgrounds are, are going there to learn how to become a developer, for example. And so for me, these schools, these new schools are quite accessible. Um, um, and uh, if you talk about, you know, TVET and how we can adapt this to technical and vocational training, that's a very also interesting question. Uh, and uh, I've wrote a report on this about TVET in Africa and how it evolves, how it develops. And I've seen lots of very innovative ways to teach technical and vocational education, um, you know, in, in Africa, but also elsewhere. So I think it's these, these uh, new pedagogies, these new ways of teaching and learning are also apl applicable to, to TVET. 
Maybe last question with a quick um, comment. Uh, Katrin asked that she really likes his real life approaches, but um, is it really healthy to teach stress and pressure? Like, should universities not be places for experiencing deep learning and wasting time? <laughs> Very interesting question. I agree. I mean, honestly, if, if we could erase stress from our daily lives, I would, I would do it for sure. Uh, but, you know, in the, in the example of Hyper Island, they prepare them to be, you know, managers of, of teams, uh, especially like creativity teams. So these type of things can happen and happen in real life. And so everything they want is just to prepare them for their jobs of the future and that of, uh, they want to prepare them to you know, situation that might happen, that might arise. And that's why they, they try to add to this, this layer of uh, not stress, but adaptability, you know, being adaptable and being able to, to adapt to situations that arise and that you haven't, you know, foreseen, like COVID, for example, you know. So these types of situations can arise and you have to be ready somehow. Wonderful. Thanks a lot, Svenja.